Hey guys, welcome back. Last week we talked about Mac platforms, and one of humanity's most powerful tools to defend planets in the Halo universe. They're not perfect, and they come with several drawbacks, because you know, obviously if they were, as we saw in the games, Reach would not have fallen, nor would Regret have ever made it to Earth. So what then is the best way to defend a planet? How could we defend Earth today? Well that's what we're going to talk about. Join me this week as we take a deep dive into what it means to build a planetary defense system. And if this is content you're interested in, consider subscribing, it really does help me out as a new channel as well as joining our brand new discord if you're curious about asking questions or seeing more of the behind the scenes info but without waiting too much longer let's jump into it when we talk about planetary defense and halo they rely heavily on orbital defense platforms to defend themselves that's kind of the unsc staple is those mac platforms and orbital defense platforms they range in size and firing cadence the largest seen around reach according to the lore at least were required being tethered to the surface for power generation now in the last video i kind of talked about it a little bit about how i thought that was more or less impossible and i still feel that way but hey it's fiction i won't hold it against the authors in lore though this is what led to their downfall because fixed ground stations like that are you know vulnerable to both subterfuge as well as ground assault and that's exactly how the covenant attacked them taking out the power source and negating their ability to defend from orbit another huge drawback when we talk about fixed defense platforms is the fact that well they're fixed they can't move. I mean, it's really hard to move massive objects around orbits. And so what that means is good reconnaissance by the Covenant. They can plan, model, and simulate strikes against the UNSC, knowing full well what little means they have to otherwise mask those positions. This gives the Covenant the ability to rehearse over and over exactly how they plan to attack a planet, making them very, very well trained when the actual mission comes up. This all leads to the UNSC's secondary defense effort, and in my opinion, most likely their best, and that is the use of their naval ships. By having such a large fleet of capable vessels, the UNSC maintains a defensive posture that can be both massed, you know, to avoid detection, as well as massing them on the Covenant to destroy attacking forces. Although the UNSC has always had a significant disadvantage to the Covenant when we talk about one-on-one, -on -one, you know, ship combat, especially now with the advent of new ships modified with Forerunner technology like the Infinity, rest in peace as well as the eternity there's still their means to exploit to destroy the covenant so all that said we clearly do not have neither mac guns nor ships in space so what could we reasonably do today to defend ourselves well yes clearly we're not the unsc we don't have the technology nor the capability to build or even match what they have but that does not make us defenseless, however. There have been several studies and projects into how we can defend ourselves not from aliens per se, but from asteroids. But, as I'll show you, any technology meant to defeat an asteroid can reasonably be retasked to destroy an incoming ship as well. Starting with how we detect objects that pose a danger to us, there's a lot out there. You know, a significant number of asteroids. And they're much more likely to end life on this planet than aliens, at least for now. This fact is not missed by most governments. NASA, the ESA, the Japanese space agency they all work together to identify and catalog threats it started ever since we started looking to the skies but reasonably you know back in 1998 that's when nasa truly did set out to identify all threats larger than a kilometer that being kind of a rough estimate for the size that would go from regional catastrophe you know maybe influencing a continent to a worldwide extinction event this mission would continue until ultimately being ratified as part of nasa's congressional funding in 2005 and was set up as more or less a permanent mission. Currently, NASA and its partners rely on a few different methods to kind of detect and spot threats. You have the Catalina Sky Survey Telescope at the Stewart Observatory near Tucson in Arizona. Another setup is going to be the Pan Stars Survey Site, which is located in Hawaii on the different mountaintops. The last significant player that's come on in the last few years was the Atlas Array. These are more or less meant for a last minute warning, and they're in Hawaii, Chile, South Africa, Australia, and Japan, as well as assistance in Europe, all being managed by both NASA as well as their partners. And the way the system works is it's, you know, surveying the night sky. You're trying to spot reflections of light. You know that stars are fixed, so using algorithmic assistance, these telescopes scan the entire horizon every night, and they spot moving dots that represent asteroids or really any other object. The goal was and has been met that by 2008, NASA had already cataloged 90% of one kilometer sized objects. Pop-up threats can still occur, 
but it is more, you know, significantly less likely that a world's ending threat will simply appear. For the most part, we know kind of what's coming. The nearest threat we face, you know, is actually this March. March 11th is when Echo Delta 224, a asteroid discovered in 2005, will pass close enough to have a 0.0002% chance of impacting. And if it did, it would hit with the force of 18 megatons, roughly the size of a large thermonuclear warhead. Other asteroids, such as Apophis, which used to be, you know, like when I was a kid, a staple of that world-ending asteroid out there, have actually been ruled out using these survey sites like I talked about, as well as the Goldstone Deep Space Radar Station to track. And it was found by updating its orbit, you know, its orbit model in 2021 as it made another close approach, that it no longer poses a threat because it was actually expected to potentially hit the planet in 2029. Another asteroid that has a significant, you know, according to science chance of hitting us is the Bennu asteroid. It has a 0.0003% chance impacting in 2182, but if it did, that would have an impact force of 1200 megatons, going well beyond anything we've seen today. These threats are cataloged by NASA in its near-Earth objects section. The highest risk asteroids are monitored via the Century Risk Table. These potentially hazardous asteroids, PHAs as they're called, are then monitored via sites like Goldstone, which is surface-based here on Earth and it uses radar to map things well out in the solar system. You also have options such as telescopes like the NEOWISE ones that are stationed in orbit. These can use either, like I said, radar reflections or infrared energy reflected from the object from the sun to get a better model of the object's motion. That allows us to continuously refine its orbit to understand how close it will come. So that's how we spot something, but what do we do if it's going to be a threat? Well, it all depends on how much time we have. But for the most part, everything we do is going to rely on either moving the orbit or destroying the object. And the first one is significantly easier than the latter. The DART mission last fall showed that NASA could successfully impact a small asteroid with a satellite. And that impact will have a minor effect on the orbit. But when we talk about the scale of that over the entire solar system, that means that it will miss Earth. Granted, that asteroid was never a threat. That was more of just a technology demonstrator. As the threat level increases, almost all the answers we have ultimately lead to the use of our most powerful weapons, which in today's age is going to be nuclear warheads. In 1967, scientists from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, conducted what they call Project Icarus. This was a study to devise a plan to use rockets to deflect or destroy an asteroid on collision course. And ultimately what they found is that by using five Saturn V rockets, each equipped with 100 megaton nukes, space in the weeks and days prior to impact, they could destroy or deflect a 1.6 kilometer asteroid. In the years since, not much has changed to that plan. And you know, NASA's found that nuclear warheads really do offer a best shot. They are 10 to 100 times more impactful than non-nuclear methods. In 2011, Dr. Bong Gui from Iowa State University proposed what he called the hypervelocity asteroid intercept vehicle. This would use a kinetic precursor to crater the asteroid and then have a follow-up subsurface nuclear detonation. This effectively meant that most of the nuclear energy released went into the asteroid, which has you know, a greater effect on its orbit. By their calculations, with a warning time of only 30 days, they could prevent a 300 meter sized asteroid from hitting Earth. Now, actual government efforts to keep, you know, defensive missiles on the stock are not very well known, though there have been some hints. In 2014 and 2015, government oversight documents between the NNSA and the Oversight Agency was discussing the breakdown decommissioning of older U.S. nuclear warheads. And they made mention of the fact that they were delaying the decommissioning of the 9 megaton B-52 sub-assemblies. This is just like the carriage, if you will. And the reason they were delaying it was because there was a need identified in the government for planetary defensive missiles. The idea being that they could have a stockpile of sub-assemblies that are ready to accept a warhead that could then be mounted onto a rocket should the need arise. That gives us very quick reaction time, at least as a nation and a planet, that, you know, like we said, if there's a threat 30 days out, it could be manufactured, or in this case, really just assembled and launched, hopefully in the span of a few days or less, giving us the best chance to escape serious impacts. Bringing it back to Halo, you know, we were talking about how in comparison to the UNSC, we're, we're clearly limited by our technology. More specifically, our ability to move mass into orbit. When it comes down to it, that's really the hardest part. The Saturn V rocket proposed in the Project Icarus, that's the largest rocket we've ever built out of any country on the planet. You know, SpaceX is talking about their Starship, which have demonstrated some technologies, including a, a very recent engine run, but they still haven't made a final product. Last year, NASA and the United States were able to launch the Space Launch System, but that was 
is the Block 1 variant that's still smaller. We have yet to build something that surpasses the payload capability of the Saturn V rocket. The UNSC doesn't have this issue. I mean, they have Mac guns, they have ships, and we don't. But there are several areas where we have tools that we use, I think, a little bit better than the UNSC. And that kind of combining the two could really build a hard system to defend yourself. Like we talked about, fixed orbital defense sites can be exploited. We saw that in the fall of Reach. Ships can be destroyed. But one area the UNSC has always lacked was the use of missiles, particularly ground-based or even space-based. Now, I'm not talking about ship-on-ship -ship combat. I'm talking about having missiles either staged in orbit as part of a station system or even just floating that can be then queued to a threat tasked and then sent out to destroy it you know I, i've played the games and i've read the books and i know some of these takes that i have can be relatively spicy and i get a lot of comments talking about how missiles are useless well i disagree sometimes there's benefit just for having volume instead of having one frigate out there trying to launch missiles on its own you could potentially launch a huge mass like envelope of a hundred to a thousand missiles that puts the onus on the covenant to be able to intercept all of them likewise i remain unconvinced i'm sorry it's just true that the way the covenant shields work could actually prevent them from suffering the ill effects of a nuclear explosion a lot of nuclear's effects especially when we talk about like x-rays electromagnetic like heat and light and neutrino stuff like that simply cannot be mitigated through shields like the covenant are shown to you know it doesn't mean that their shields are useless nor does it mean that nuclear missiles are the end all be all and i'm not convinced that the covenant can simply tank nuclear impacts like they say they can in the lore and the reason that's important is because like i said it all comes down to defending yourself you can't think of it just as being one system humanity cannot solely rely on mac platforms in space nor can they solely rely on their navy or can they rely solely on missiles it comes down to an idea called the onion concept and this is true today for integrated air defense systems and so it's the exact same you know in 2552 when we talk about integrated space defense systems. Mac guns are your heavy hitting point defenses close into the planet. You can then use ground and space based nuclear missiles for standoff capability system wide. Much like the proposed, you know, Project Icarus design or the HIV, you take a two stage nuclear delivery system. You have a kinetic impactor, maybe that's a mini Mac, you know, brought along as part of the warhead that hits just prior and destabilizes the shield of the Covenant ship. And then a follow up nuclear warhead specifically meant to punch through the armor of the ship detonating inside. I mean, we already have have bunker buster munitions that are meant to bury very very deep through incredibly reinforced armor doing so much like an asteroid would absolutely cripple covenant ships and okay maybe their shields can take one but when we're talking about a very massed you know launch like a huge salvo that can have a serious effect in line with that it's not discussed very much but we know that the unsc in their arsenal at least they have mines mining a solar system can really help funnel the covenant into kill zones that's really what it's about right you want to put the enemy where you want them to be you don't let them dictate the battlefield to you we see that in halo 2 humanity kind of failed to do that obviously the covenant had an idea of the layout of humanity's forces because they jumped just outside a range of earth's mac guns they did that knowing that they were gonna you know they wouldn't be able to get affected and instead they sent small ships to destroy them exactly as we saw in the campaign but if you were to mine that dead space you know put mines all over the space around earth that you knew that was outside of your mac guns Forcing the Covenant to make a decision, they can either jump into the mines, potentially losing ships, or straight into the kill zone where humanity's Mac guns as well as naval ships could press the advantage in firepower. Like I said, it's all about layers, low close in with Mac guns, mid to long range with missiles, dynamic forces like ships, and then denial tools like mines. Combine these together builds a huge network that really does serve, you know, as planetary defense. You prevent yourself from being attacked. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown of the ways that we can defend ourselves today and how these very concepts could then shape how the UNSC defends themselves against the Covenant. This is going to be the first video in a series actually building up to the fall of Reach. Next week, we're going to be exploring how effectively to spot, fix, and destroy a planet. And then the final video will discuss everything the UNSC did right and everything they did wrong ultimately when they lost the battle for Reach. In the meantime, take care, be safe, enjoy the weekend, and if you like videos like this, feel free to subscribe, leave me a like, and join the Discord. Take care, I'll see you guys later.